uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to share my research with you. Mm, I want to show you some of the results of my research on labor relation in the Peruvian visa royalty during the 17th century. Following the cluster annual, annual topic, labor and spatiality, I will focus on the geographical differences I found on those labor relations that were closer to servitude, and that implies some kind of coercion. Since I guess you are not necessarily expert on colonial Latin America, in the introduction, I will summarize some topics that are important for this talk. The Spanish conquest started at the beginning of the 16th century in the so-called Viceroyalty of Peru that included almost all Spanish South America. The conquest, the wars, labor conditions, and epidemic were the main causes of the demographic collapse that affected the whole territory. Until the end of the 16th century and in average, the native population decreased almost 80%. The European conquest, however, was only effective in part of the territory. There remained a constant warlike border with indigenous people that were conquered only during the 19th century. Indigenous people living in those borders and close to the Spanish territories were sometimes, sometimes captured and in, enslaved. The extensive sea coast of the Spanish empire in America was also a belligerent border because of the presence of smugglers and pirates. The demographic consequences of the conquest were different across the continent and affected an already heterogeneous population distributions. In terms of labor force and talking from the perspective of the invaders, there were territories where indigenous population was relevant in terms of number and were most of the labor force. For example, at the beginning of the conquest, the demographic center was located around Cusco, uh, that was the hearth of the Inca Empire, and later of for other regions around Potosí. Other territories combined enslaved African people and an important number of indigenous workers, for example, Colombia, while other remained marginal with fewer workers available, for example, Tucumán. In the Peruvian visa royalty, the economic center coincided with the most populated territory, present-day Bolivia and South Peru. In those territories, mining activity was central and it provided most of the incomes for the crown. The importance of this activity explained why all labor relations related to it were at the center of the official discussions. In this table, you can see the original production of gold and silver as a percentage of total world output. The Visa Royalty of Peru was the most important producer of those precious metals during the 17th century. At the beginning of the century, Potosí produced almost 90% of the silver, and this was the most important income for, for the crown, meaning more than 90% of the income in present-day Bolivia. Potosí, and in general mining activity, was central for the development of a kind of internal market. Almost all the region produced something that was consumed in Charcas, from yerba mate in Paraguay to textiles in Quito. My analysis of labor relations in the, in the Peruvian visa royalty then will compare Charcas, the hearth of the economy and a region where indigenous population were, were the majority and whose political and social organization was and remained complex with other regions that were less important for the treasure, but perhaps not for the so-called internal, ma internal market, Paraguay, Tucumán, and Quito. The composition and the quantity of their population was also different, uh, and, and it is precisely these different contexts that interest me. I will briefly describe the most relevant labor relations in terms of number of people involved, which occur in the visa royalty of, of Peru after the conquest. According to the literature and in general terms, indigenous slavery was forbidden early after the demographic collapse 
in the Caribbean island, except in case of war. Enslavem, enslavement was common, for example, in southern Chile, and it was legalized there in 1608 by the crown. As you have seen in the first map, the warlike border was extensive. Although not everywhere, slavery was relevant in, num in numerical terms. Indigenous people were considered vassal of the crown. That is, they were free people who had to pay a tribute as part of their vassalage. Although this could be a general definition of their status, we will see how in practice their relations with the Spaniard varied greatly as did the definition of their obligations. I would just like to point out that although they were free people, many of their labor relations were coercive. At the beginning of colonial time, the most widespread form of labor requirement, especially in the viceroyalty of Peru, was the encomienda, legitimized by the crown. This royally sanctioned institution entitled some of those Spaniards taking part in the conquest, acquiring rights to receive tributes from a native authority and from any people subject to it. In return, the beneficiary had to promote their worth, welfare and guarantee that the indigenous people embrace the Christian doc doctrine. The beneficiary was also obliged to offer military defense to his residential jurisdiction. Indigenous people were obliged to pay tributes in wood, silver, gold, or personal service. The Spanish then could have access to the labor force and sometimes to capital needed to develop agriculture, mining, and ranching enterprises from the beginning. Most encomiendas benefit individuals though a few were under direct control of the crown. I want to stress here that the classic encomienda imply a native authority and people subject to him or her, that is an organized community and not individuals. This is relevant regarding colonial domination. The indirect rule was prevalent in Central Andes, that is that native authorities play a central role in, in tribute collection and the organization of the meta and or labor. Specialists in the Peruvian viceroyalty noted that toward the end of the 16th century, most of the encomiendas have disappeared, meaning that indigenous people belonging to them became royal tributaries. In other words, as the encomenderos died out, indigenous people began to pay tribute to the crown. That was a great advantage in, term, in terms of mobility of labor force, as, did, as they did not have a specific master and could be employed in different enterprises. However, encomiendas persisted everywhere but in Central Andes, although they involved different forms of labor relations. The Yanaconas were, broadly speaking, people that did not belong to a community and who did not recognize a cacique, that is a native authority. There were different types of Yanaconas ranging from independent artisans in the cities to servants living and working in haciendas attached to the land. I will describe more in detail these kind of workers in the course of the talk. I put in this list servitude or personal service, that is men and women of all ages working for Spaniards in their houses and land or land all day. In some places they were called yanaconas, but not everywhere. That is why I put them separately. This kind of service was forbidden, but it was also present throughout the viceroyalty. The majority of the tributary had two main obligations, tribute and meter. The taxes indigenous people were obliged to pay in labor, money, or good was early defined or evaluated for men aged 18 to 50, and it was called tribute. 
Women, child, and elderly people were not obliged, in theory, to pay tribute. However, we find exceptions everywhere. A percentage of the tributary were also applied all, almost everywhere to the Mita. In general terms, Mita involved chief work. There were different kinds of Mita, being the most famous, the mining Mita. The mining Mita implied that different provinces were to send a percentage of their men to Potosí and Huancavelica and some other smaller mines for a, a specific period of time to work in the mining activity for specific Spaniards. In addition to the mining Mita, there were other types of Mita throughout the visa royalty, some of which invo involve personal service, as we will see in the talk. Finally, tributaries were classified differently throughout the territory, depending on their history, origin, land rights, power relations, etc. The classification has ma mainly fiscal implication and denoted fiscal and or labor obligations. As I will show you, I found in Chargas at the end of the 17th century, more than 50 different forms of calling indigenous people. Certainly, most of them have sim similar meaning but the var variety is interesting in order to take into account regional differences. These denominations were present in the main source I used for my research on labor relations, a, la a journal inspection made in 1683. This is an ex exceptional document in many aspects. First, it is one of the few general inspections, which is a kind of census, that is relatively well preserved for almost all the colonial provinces of present day Bolivia. There are almost uh, 20,000 manuscript pages that recorded the indigenous population of 15 provinces and five cities. Those are not all the provinces and city where the inspection was conducted, but the other are lost. Most of the other regional general inspections have, see, has, have been partially or totally lost or are not as rich in information. Second, we find detailed information from almost all the provinces regarding the indigenous people, that is the majority of the population in those days. And on some occasion, they are non-indigenous couples. What kind of information did we find? The composition of the family, the places of origin, their categorization, the places in them they were living and working, the names of their master, if they paid tribute and how much, if they were mitayos, their names and ages, and in some occasion, short stories of their life. For example, Melchor Quispi, 46 year old from the town of Calamarca, Although he say he is not from this town, but from the city of Cusco, from where España brought him to the town of Calamarca, where he was raised and married and was visited in this town, having already paid in, uh, the taxes and having gone to the meter of Potosí. And after he was widowed, he went to La Paz, where he married Isabel Yapoma and has been then for five years. I organized a project in 2013 and made a database with all the information of those provinces and city. I also work in different archive consulting and uh, comple complementary sources such as criminal records, tribute incomes, correspondence, etc. As you can see in this map, the governors visited their provinces and made this kind of census sometimes very quickly and sometimes slowly. Time and quality are closely related. More time implies that perhaps people could be included twice in the census because they move a lot or not at all. But it also implies that the governor traveled and visited almost all the places and took note of many details. 
This other map is a summary of the, uh, of the principal categorization I found in the census. For this talk, the most important color is yellow. That is all Yanaconas and other servants working and living in Spanish houses and lands. On the map, I have separated other Yanaconas whose labor relations were different. They are orange and were called Yanaconas del Rey, Yanaconas of the Queen, King. They sometimes live in Spanish lands, but had more freedom to move. As you can see, the geographical distribution of all the categories, and particularly of these two, is variable. The Yanaconas del Rey were important in two cities, La Paz and La Plata, and the other Yanaconas in some provinces like Tarija, Yamparaes, and Larecaja. The meaning and labor implication of each, each category, category is, dif is difficult to define if they are analyzed just based on the name. Although the name is important, of course. My experience is that it's necessary to know not only the category, but also the places where people were living if they had masters to whom were they paying tribute and other details. We also know that people could change their categorization, for example, a Yanacona could be a forastero after leaving his or her place of residence or after running away and changes, change, changing his or her name. We also know that a man or a woman could, could be living and working as a Yanacona, but be categorized in a different way. However, I think that it's important to know if forced form of labor relations were the majority or just ex exceptions in the region we are working on, and how are they, uh, are they geographically distributed? That's the reason why I believe that this kind, kind of exercise, such as the one I did with the general inspection, is important beyond the problem involved in the analysis. Although it, it is also necessary to identify the biases in the sources that the sources might have. I'm going to explain now how I analyzed the Yanaconas de Chargas and later how I reconsider the Yanaconas in a broader context. During 2015, I worked with <laughs> Sarah Alvisbeek, who is yet here, analyzing more than 120 cases in which people were discussing the way they were categorized. The cases were from the north of the Audiencia de Lima and Chargas. One of the main results of our research was the distribution of the demand of freedom. Almost all of them were located in the southeast of Chargas. Most of those people were native that claim that they were not Yanaconas, but free people. The comparison they made of their situation with that of the slave was common, <clears throat> and many of them thought that being a slave was better than being a Yenacona. Why? Some of them explained that enslaved people had more advantages than they did. The reference Yenacons made of slavery is a good starting point for the definition of the Yenaconaje. Yenaconas were free people, vassal of the crown, people who had been forcibly separated from their community or had left them freely, they or their parents. They did not have communal obligation such as the mining meter, nor have they communal access to land, and they had to live in other people's land, paying in good or labor for this occupation. At the beginning of the conquest, the majority of the Yanaconas were living around Cusco, but just a few decades later, during the general inspection made by Viceroy Francisco de Toledo in 1575, the Yanaconas of Chargas were an important percentage of them. Viceroy Toledo dictated specific ordinance regarding the Yanaconas. He understood that they were central to the production, production of food for the mining center and decided that they were obliged to, to be fixed to the land. According to the ordinances, 
Ayanacona could not leave the property on which he or she was working. If he or she did, the master could arrange his or her capture and return him or her by force. There are many testimony of Yanaconas claiming that their master had put them or their families in prison. According to these sources, living and working condition of the Yanaconas were different in the different provinces. Coercion was more important in those provinces where the warlike border was close and there where indigenous land was scarce. We also saw that for many of the Yanaconas, the delimitation of the tribute had no significance. The whole family worked for their master in their houses or land without limits. They were working together with other la laborers, such as enslaved Africans, whose obligations were similar or sometimes better because they worked as foremen. In theory, Yanaconas inherit their condition, but there were other ways to become one. Among others, a master included indigenous migrants into the census as Yanaconas, and some indigenous tributary fled their communities because they wanted to avoid the mining meter and went, and went to the haciendas. Because of this migration during the 17th century, the Yanaconas were important in terms of numbers in Chargas, especially in some provinces. All the Yanaconas together were almost a third of the tributary uh, population. However, and as I say, only part of those Yanaconas can be considered servants, together with other people classified as such. They were 12% of the whole of the whole indigenous population in Chargas. They were living and working both in cities and in rural areas together with other indigenous people whose labor relations were, di were different. From the analysis of the general inspection, I have, been, I have been able not only to observe the distribution of all categories and their numbers, but also to think about the omissions. This was uh, especially important in some cases where, for example, no account was given of any indigenous person being in the service of, of a Spaniard in his or her home, something that is practically unthinkable in the cities. These omissions were key to the analysis of the, of the quality of the sources, which varied great, greatly from province to province. The labor conditions for the Yanaconas were like other that we found in other regions under the name, and their other names, as you will see in the next section. In 2017, I started a research project with other colleagues that are experts in Tucumán and Paraguay, two regions adjacent to Chargas. Although all the regions belong to the same jurisdiction, the Audiencia de Chargas, their historiography discusses different topics related, of course, to the central historical questions each region has. We wanted to ask the same question, focused on labor relations. And to do that, we decided to put into di dialogue three general inspections from the 17th century. We choose dialogue as methodology because the inspections are different and also the regions. So the comparison was difficult. The population size is one of the differences you can see in this map. The economy also, as I already say, the economy in Charcas was based on mining and that of Paraguay and Tucumán on agriculture. The principal objective of the, of the inspection made, made in Tucumán and in Paraguay were the encomiendas, whereas in Charcas the inspection included all tributaries. The dialogue, the dialogue allows us to think about similarities in this context of differences and also to rethink the meaning of the different forms of labor relations. It also allowed us to propose hypotheses for cases where we found clear omissions, for example, the absence of some indigenous groups in the registers. It was particularly interesting to rethink the Yanaconas 
an institution that was, was absent in Tucumán and Paraguay. This institution was early forbidden in those regions, although the labor relations implied by Yane Conasco clearly persisted. The inspection made in Tucumán was focused on the encomiendas, an institution with, with had different meanings. The history of these encomiendas followed the conquest of the territory and did not necessarily imply community, communities, as it did in the Central Andes. Toward the end of the 17th century, for example, we find encomiendas made up of indigenous people captured in the warlike borders. Those people were living and working in Spanish houses and lands in similar terms as the Yanaconas. In Paraguay, the principal objective of the, of the inspection was, were also the encomiendas, although it included another group of indigenous people called originarios. The meaning of these originarios of Paraguay was different from that of the originarios of Chargas. In Paraguay, they were living in the cities, in Spanish houses, in similar labor relations to that of the urban Yanaconas of Chargas. The differences we found among the sources and the context, context may, made our research difficult. We decided to work mainly on cases with the aim of find, finding similarities across the territory. We tried to distinguish what the originarios of Paraguay, the small groups of warlike indigenous peoples scattered among the Spanish families of, of Tucumán, and the Yanaconas or servants of Chargas had in common. We found two characteristics that were present almost everywhere. The first characteristic was the separation of them from their group of belonging. They were mostly individual or small families. There were, for example, many children that were separated from their parents and put into service in Spanish houses, far away from their communities. The second characteristic was the permanent assignment to the service of the, of the Spaniards, which enabled, enabled them to be identified as servant, a condition that was also hereditary and did not allow their save. The separation of the Yanaconas from their group of belonging deprived them of land and severed their ties with the native authorities. The life of, of uh, these people, unable to return to their villages of origin, were marked mostly by personal dependency. We have observed in Charcas that the Yanaconas lost their freedom of movement. Although they were legally free and could not be sold, they were bound for life to the land and could only live if the owner authorized it. Moreover, if the owner sold the haciendas, it was transferred with the Yanaconas inside, who, on the other hand, added value to it. Personal service was present also in other forms that are important for a broader analysis. We have seen that there were cases in which the tribute was paid with labor, although in, th in theory, it had to be limited. An example of the regula regulation of the tribute is to be found in Paraguay, where indigenous people of the Paraguayan encomiendas had to comply with the mita as a form of tribute payment. However, a woman who was in her encomendero's house had to serve him on demand and her work was not limited. On the few occasions in which some kind of payment for this work is mentioned, it was in form of wood, a piece of clothing, shelter and food. The unlimited service distinguished this person from the tributary males who were obliged to fulfill their obligation as long as they were between 18 and 50 years old and able to work. Personal service or servitude was widespread in Tucumán and Paraguay and slightly less on Chargas. In the later region, however, this was highly dependent on the province. The ways in which these uh, people was recognized were different 
avoiding the use of the word Yanacona in Tucumán and Paraguay, even though, even though the labor relations were the same. The term personal service was also avoided, although in some, in, sometimes appear in claims. However, the, thames, the term service Indian was spoken, spoken of a matter of course. What united these people, in addition to all that has been said, was that they had no possibility of choosing who to work for, nor what activity to carry out, nor when. The, the, uh, the work was therefore involuntary and left them with no time, time for themselves. During 2023, we worked with Sarah Alispik in Quito, in the National Archive, in a different project on, the seven, on a 17th century traveler. During this day in Quito, I look, of course, for the Yanaconas. Sources concerning them were just a few. However, unlike in Paraguay or Tucumán, I found, I found other labor relations that were similar. What really surprised me was the Mita and how through that institution, many Spaniards could access to free workers for their different needs. With an example, I will show you why were for me similar to the labor relations of the Yanaconas of Chargas. In 1683, the priest Francisco Vázquez de Espinosa, a resident of Cuenca, claimed for his right to have a Mita Indian to look after his sheep. At the trial, he, the priest enclosed a bill of sale which clearly, clearly states that he has acquired 200 sheep and the right to enjoy the service of a mitayo to look after them. In the notarial records, we found dozens of deeds of this type. That is the purchase of a pro property together with the right to personal service. In the case of the priest, his need for someone to do the work was satisfied by the mita. In Chargas, we would have found a Yanacona shepherd who took care for the sheep. In Quito, we find different indigenous people who in turn performed the job of shepherd. The task performed was probably the same as were the working conditions. However, in Chargas, the Yanaconas lived and worked on the Spaniards' land. And in Quito, the work was carried out by different people living in their lands who each one went for a limited period. The pressure on the ethnic authority in Quito was growing, growing. And in that period, that is late 17th century, the number of tributary had fallen dramatically. In theory, the Mitayos were supposed to be a percentage of the tributary, which in Quito was, was one fifth. In this way, a group of indigenous people left the community to carry out tasks des destined for pub public work or to work for different, different Spaniards, and the rest worked to collect what they owe as tribute and for their own sub subsistence. However, complaints indicated that this percentage exceeded half of the tributaries in many cases, forcing them to work constantly and leaving them, them no time for their own needs. The so-called personal service had a long life in the viceroyalty of Peru, despite the many ordinances and law that prohibited it from very early on. In this talk, I show you how result a key in different projects that analyze labor relations marked by coercion in a large territory included in the viceroyalty of Peru during the 17th century. The main characteristic I found for this labor relation was that the work was involuntary and left them with no time for themselves. People have no possibility of choosing who to work for, nor what activity to carry out, nor when. 
I also tried to show you some of the way in which I thought about their territorial distribution and also their quantitative importance. Finally, I show you some of the analysis developed trying to include the problems that the sources pose. I know this is a lot of condensed information that is perhaps not very easy to follow, but I hope that some of it has helped you to understand the coercive labor relation that existed in this vast territory. Thank you very much. <clears throat>